Today's daf is Samach Gimel. Uh, all right, I'll just review where we are in the meantime before we begin the daf. <clears throat> Yesterday, we saw a brisa that argues with our Mishnah. Our Mishnah is of the opinion that any time you have a mixed thought of different people, people, some of whom are kosher, some of whom are non-kosher, the korban is still kosher. It's only when you have exclusively for non-kosher people, for arelim, for uncircumcised people, that the korban is not kosher. The acherim disagree. The, a, a group of rabbanon who we'll see aligns with Rabbi, the sheet of Rabbi Meir and Zvachim uh, is, are of the opinion that it depends on the sequence of your thought. If your initial thought is for mulim and then for arelim, originally for circumcised and then for uncircumcised, the carbon is kosher. But if the sequence is first you think about arelim and then you think about mulim, the bris is uh, the, <laughs> the the carbon is this puzzle. The carbon is not is not kosher. Okay. So the question is, what's the machlokas? So <clears throat> here we are, the very top of Samach Gimel. Lema kasavri acherim eno lishchita elo basofu chidarava da'avarava adayin hi machlokas. Now, there's a huge background which is going, which I, I'm going to try and condense and uh, simplify. I hope I'm not oversimplifying it because there's a very lengthy Rashi here that goes into a whole bunch of different background. But the basic idea is as follows. We know that Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yossi argue on the issue of tfos lashon rishon. Do we take the, a person's initial statement and discard his second statement? That's Rabbi Meir. And Rabbi Yossi says, you take into account his full statement from beginning to end. Now, <clears throat> the Gemara in Zvachim proves that Rabbi Meir is of the opinion, at least according to one Manda Amar, that Rav Meir is of the opinion that even when a person is not contradicting himself, let's say a person were to say half of this carbon is an ola and half of this carbon is a shlamin. Rava wants to argue that according to Rav Meir, the entire carbon is an ola because you only reckon with the first part of his statement even when the second part does not contradict the first part. When it comes to Kachim, it's a special law by, by Kachim that you only reckon with the first part of his statement. Once he says even a portion of the animal is an Ola, it permeates throughout the entire animal. The Gemara wants to suggest, that, and that's what Rava means when he says, Adayin hi machlokas. The argument between Reb Meir and, and Reb Yossi is not only when a person's second part of his statement contradicts the first part, but when even when it's non-contradictory, Rav Meir says, Rav uh, Rava holds that Rav Meir maintains that you only reckon with the first part of his statement. And therefore, the, the ramification is going to be uh, that <clears throat> we look at the, um, the, the, we look at only a very small portion of his statement of having relevance. Hilkach and the second thing that the Gemara wants to say is that the critical moment of Shechita is at the end, when you complete the Shechita. Now here's, the, and the two go hand in hand. According to Rava, the, Rash, this is really what Rashi tries to prove, that according to Rava who says, that you always only reckon with the first part of his statement, it turns out that Rav is of the opinion that there's only one split-second juncture when you're actually doing the avoda of shechita. There, there's, there's two ways of looking at shechita. Shechita could be a five-second procedure from the beginning of when you place the blade in, beginning to uh, incise the animal's throat until the end when you've completely severed the windpipe and the, uh, the, the trachea and the, and the esophagus, okay? That's one way of looking at it, that it's, let's take, it takes three to five seconds. The other way of looking at it is, is that the avoda of shechita is only at that critical juncture when you've completed the severance of the two simanim, of the two, of the two pipes in the animal's throat. And that's the way Rebbe Meir looks at it. That's the way Rava, I'm sorry, Rava interprets Rebbe Meir. And therefore, the, what we're suggesting is as follows. When we say tfos lashon rishon, we're talking about a guy who only has a split second to coincide his thoughts with the avoda. 
There's no time, if the shechita is a split-second avoda, there's no time to have multiple thoughts during that split second. And therefore, we say as follows, Hilka hiktim mulem la'arelim, mulen chayli, arelim lo chayli. Therefore, if a person is going to have multiple thoughts, then we look at only the first thought that he has as coinciding with that split second of shechita, because there's no time for the second statement to set in. And therefore, we say, mulen chayli, arelim lo chayli. When he says, I plan to do this, and he's going to actually have to articulate this verbally, because when we deal with kadshim, the way to determine a person's thinking is to hear what he has to say. So he's going to say, I'm doing this for uh, mulim, and that's at the moment that the shechita is completed, and it's that critical juncture that you reckon with his thought thinking, and arelim lo chayli, and therefore the secondary f- statement of I'm doing this for arelim is already past the, 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 the juncture, that critical juncture of shechita. Hiktim arelim lemulim, arelim chayli, mulin lo chayli. But if his first statement, if his first thinking is for arelim, so then the critical juncture that coincides with the avoda of shechita is only for arelim, and therefore, you only take that into account because that's the sole thought that the person is having at that critical juncture of shechita. And for mulim, that he says afterward, there's that critical juncture of shechita, that's not chal at all. And that's why the achirim say that um, it depends on the sequence, because the sequence uh, is at that split second. You can't have multiple thoughts at that split second, so we only take into account the first thing that you say and think. Yes. What it sounds like is it, the, the split second, that last cut, or whatever you want to call it, is that is the moment. So it's really what he's thinking at that moment, as opposed to what his first thought is, isn't it? It's what he's thinking at that moment, but and what and what the gem, what the Gemara is saying is is that since your thought at that moment is what counts, when the Brisa says you said you, that you think it's for a Raylam and then for Mulim. It has to be at that moment of that of that split second, and the problem is is that you can't have, you 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 have to think sequentially, and there's no time for a uh, a, a sequential second thought at that split second of shechita. Depends when he started to say that. That's what he's. It depends. Around. I know it depends when you started to say it, but the assumption is is that the the statement of the brisa that when you're saying it, it's during the avoda. So the only time that's during the avoda is that completion of shechita. So you started the, the thought statement at the beginning of the avoda, and that beginning of the avoda also was the end of the avoda. There's no time for a second statement. Amar yeah. Rabba. So Rabba says lo. Rabba says no. I, I disagree. That's not the, um, the that's not the way the acherim look at it. La olam kesavri acherim yeshna l'shechita mitchila viatzov. Really, it's altogether possible that this price of the Acherim do hold that Shechita is a prolonged process that begins at the beginning of the Shechita and ends at the end. The Shechita could take three, three to five seconds, let's say. So what are we dealing with over here? Kigon shegomar belibo bein lamulam bein la'arelim that what we're dealing with is where you had decided in your heart, your mental commitment was that you're doing this shechita for both arelim and for mulim. However, v'hotzi b'fiv la'arelim v'lo hispik lomer l'mulim ad shenigmar ha'shechita ba'arelim. That you, that what happened was is that you couldn't, you got this, you speak with a protracted southern drawl, and so you, you said, I'm gonna shech this animal for arelim, and then by the time you started to say, and for mulim, shechita was already done. <laughs> now, you had in mind that you're going to be doing it for both arelim and for mulim. So the question is, do we take into account your thoughts to preserve the kashras of the carbon, Or do we say that, no, since your words that you said during the course of the shechita was only for arelim, it's going to be puzzle. Uva hapligi. So this is the machlokes between this brisa and our Mishnah. The Rebbe Meir Savar, Rebbe Meir, who was aligned in from the, the Gemara and Zvachim that Rashi gave us the 
background information for Savar Loba Inan Pivalibo Shavim that it's not necessary for a person's mouth and his thoughts to be aligned, and we just take into account his, ver- his verbal commitment, and since his verbal commitment was exclusively for our Elim during the course of the Shechita, that's all we take into account, and therefore the carbon is puzzled. That's what the Acherim hold. The Rabbanon Savri and the Rabbanon of our Mishnah hold, Ba'inan Pivali Boshavim that your heart and your mind have, uh, your heart and your uh, words have to be aligned. And therefore, if a person can say, but I was going to say mulim too, right? And he, I just didn't have the time to say it because I was taking my time. Then the halacha would be, according to the chachamim, that, uh, that it would still be kosher. Ukesava Reb Meir, lo bo'inam piv libo shavin, so the Gemara says, you mean to tell me that according to Reb Meir, we don't take into account your thoughts, and as long as your words commit you to something, that's the halachic reality? Or a minu, let's show that's not, that's not the case. There's a b'risa that says, or a mishnah that says, hamiskavin lomar truma v'omar maiser, maiser v'omar truma, that if a person looks at produce and designates it as truma, uh, and he meant to say maiser, or, if he, or vice versa, where he accidentally says the wrong word, or let's say a person meant to say, I'm not going into the house, you know, 123 York Hill Boulevard, and he accidentally said, I'm not going into 125 York Hill Boulevard, okay? Or or let's say he said, I'm not going to get, I take a shvua that I'm not going to get any hana'a from Ruvain, and accidentally he said Shimon instead of Ruvain. So lo amar klum achi hu pivli boshavin, that his words are are null and void if he can argue and and uh, and and state that I was thinking about something else, just the words came out wrong, which happens to all of us, right? We we sometimes misspeak because we're thinking one thing and we say the words just come out differently. So the halacha is if he can make that argument, then his statement his shvu is null and void. Or his declaration of truma is null and void. And this is a Stam Mishnah, and Stam Mishnah, an anonymous Mishnah, is usually we attribute the author to authorship to Rebbe Meir. So you see that Rebbe Meir does take into account a person's thoughts. He doesn't just isolate the, uh, the verbal <coughs> commitment. So, Ella Amar Abaye Resha, the Amar Simen Rishan Lamulan, Besimen Sheni Afla Arelam. So, rather, says Abaye, here is the issue. If you want to understand the Acherim, they're talking about the following case, and it seems that uh, what Abai is trying to explain is that there really is no machlokes between our Mishnah and the Brisa, because the Brisa is talking about a special case. It's telling us that the person who, or, or perhaps, or perhaps no, perhaps there is a machlokes between the Mishnah and the Brisa. I think this is more correct, and that the Mishnah goes according to the Chachamim and the Brisa goes according to Reb Meir, and I'll explain in just a minute. What's going on over here is that a person committed himself when he made his declaration during the Shechita, and he said, I'm hereby shechting the first of the two simonim. Remember, we have the trachea and the esophagus. The trachea is the windpipe, and the esophagus is the, is the food pipe, right? Which one is in the front of the throat? The trachea, the windpipe is in front. Person... Uh, it s- severs the trachea first, and he says, during the severance of the trachea, I'm going to have mulam in mind. And when he says, when he severs the esophagus, he says, I'm going to have not only mulam, but I'm going to have arelam in mind as well. Now, the, he says that over there, in that situation, the, the carbon is unquestionably kosher. Um, because even when he severs the second uh, pipe, He's got a combination of both Arelim and Mulam in mind. Mm-hmm. However, Seifa, but the second case of the Brisa, which is Kapasal, is the Amar Simen Rishon La Arelim, Simen Shemin Sheni La Mulam, is where he says, I'm severing the first pipe, the trachea, for Arelim, and I'm severing the second pipe, the esophagus, for both Arelim and for Mulam. De Besimen Rishon Hala Pesichi Be Mulam. So at the time of the severing of the first pipe, he's exclusively thinking about Arelim and not thinking about Mulam. Now, you could ask yourself, well, he hasn't completed the shechita yet. So if he hasn't completed the shechita, why is that an issue? The answer is, is for Reb Meir Latimi, because this price goes according to Reb Meir, who says, the Omar, mefaglin b'chatsi matir, v'rabon l'tamay odarmi ein mefaglin b'chatsi matir. The answer is that this is the machlokas between the Bryce and the mission. 
The Bryce is Rebbe Meir, who says that even after, upon the severance of even one of the simonim, you are considered to have completed an avoda. Even though you've only severed one sim and one pipe, that's considered to be a full act. And therefore, the example, the exemplar that the Gemara is citing is a machshav of pigel. Let's say a person, while he's only severing the first pipe, has a machshava that he's going to eat a kazayas chutz lizmano at the wrong time from this carbon. According to Reb Meir, that's an act of pigle for which you get kares, even though you haven't done a complete act of shechita. Severing one simon is considered to be a complete act vis-a-vis sacrificial violations that are associated with thought. So therefore, in the same vein, uh, we, no pun intended, no, no pun intended um, we, would, we, would, we would argue that if a person has a machshava exclusively for a relim while he's severing the first pipe, then that is enough to passel the carbon. The Rabbanan disagree. The Rabbanan say that you have to do the complete act of shechita, of severing both simanim, in order to have a machshava of pigel count for you to get kares for and to passel the carbon. And similarly, just having a machshava exclusively for arelim for the first simon, since you have a machshava for both arelim and for mulim during the second simon, it's not going to invalidate the carbon. So in the final analysis, that's the Gemara's conclusion, that we're talking about a special case that the reason why the carbon is puzzle, according to this price, which goes according to Rebbe Meir, is because you're severing the first simon with an exclusive machshava varelim, even though you're severing the second simon with a combined machshava, Rebbe Meir says you can isolate the machshava of the first simon's severance and use that to passel the korban. The Chachamim argue, and that's why our Mishnah says it makes no difference whether you think about arelim first and mulam second, or mulam first and arelim second. Okay? So when there's a contradiction to in your, between divor and machshava, we don't we don't hold machshavah mice and everything, right? I mean, we would go with divor, right? Well, it depends. It depends what halacha. Here we're talking specifically about kadshim. So, and we extend it, we extend it to Hilcha Shvuas as well. But, um, but if a person, uh, normally we assume that a person's dibur is reflective of his machshava. But if a person says a minute after he makes his declaration, oi, I don't believe what I said, I didn't mean that, mm-hmm. then we do reckon with that. When the Brachabonus, do they say something? Bedeber, was yeah, Rashi says that with all, with all avodas of Kadshim, you have to actually verbalize what you're thinking. Did. You have an obligation to do that. With the, the question really becomes, what if a person didn't say anything? Then we, then we can assume that stam, if silence, we assume is an acquiescence to the proper protocol. That's, I believe, what the conclusion of the Gemara and Zvachim is, but, you know, that's a, Calling from fuzzy memory, in the Mishnah. Shkita, we, <coughs> in modern day Shkita, we worry about the Nashavah of the. Uh, right, that's why. That's why the Shaykhid has to say he's doing it l'shem well, mitzvah Shkita. Why do we worry about? Uh, because if he has the wrong thought, uh, then you're not eating kosher meat. Affects the kashrus? No, I don't think. I don't think by 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 regular Shkita it doesn't affect the kashrus. The guy's thinking of uh, about uh, about his own when he's doing that. Oh, that's if he's shechting for Avodah Zara. That's something different. What, what if a guy's thinking about the ball game while he's shechting? Right. That doesn't... It depends if you ask. 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 Depends if you now, the whole, this whole Mishnah is predicated upon a Pasuk in the Torah. The Pasuk in the Torah tells us, Lo sishchat al chametz dam zivchi. Remember those words, Lo sishchat al chametz dam zivchi. We lay it during the Shalosh Regalim, okay? It says, you shall not slaughter over chametz the blood of my sacrifice. Now, what that literally sounds to mean is, that when you're shechting the carbon Pesach, there should not be chametz present. So you, in your mind, you're thinking about taking this lamb, slitting its throat, and the blood flows all over a loaf of bread. That's what you're thinking about when you read that Pesach and you take it literally. But as we'll see, that's not literally what it means. What it means, how it's interpreted halachically, is not going to be defined by the mission, but the Gemara is going to have to tell us. All we know is, is that there is a prohibition of there being chametz present when you're shechting the carbon Pesach.
And now we're going to define the parameters of that violation. over below sase. So if you do that, whatever that act is, you uh, you incur a mitzvah slo sase. You've committed an avera. Rabbi Yehuda Omer af hatamid. Now comes along Rabbi Yehuda and expands it, and he says, if on erev Pesach, you shech the carbon tamid over chametz, so you also violate. And Rabbi Shimon argues. Rabbi Shimon says no. Hapesach be'arbas are lishmo chaya v'shelo lishmo pater. First of all, the violation is only with the carbon pesach, says Rabbi Shimon. Uh, and when it's on Erev Pesach. And furthermore, if it's only when you do it Lishmo. But if you Shech the Korban Pesach Shelo Lishmo, what do we know about a Korban Pesach that Shech the Shelo Lishmo on the 14th? We know that it's Pesach, right? Mm-hmm. So it turns out that that's not <clears throat> called Shechita. That's not called sacrificial shechita, and therefore I have not fulfilled the criteria of the mitzvah slosase, and therefore I haven't violated it. In other words, it's almost like that double negative again, right? Because I botched the, my, my, uh, the, the, the thoughts of this carbon Pesach, I can't be in violation of los tishchad al chametz dam zivchi. Now, usha arkol hazvachim, bein lishman uvein shalo lishman pater. And on Erev Pesach, all other karbanos, it makes no difference whether you did it with the proper thought or not the proper thought. The only violation of Elo Sishchat al Chametz Dam Zivchi on Erev Pesach is only the Korban Pesach when it's done properly, not when it's done improperly, and not with any other karbanos. That's Rib Shimon, and he argues, as you see, with Rabbi Yehuda. The furthermore, Rib Shimon says, he qualifies it further. He says, Uvemoed, that's only on Erev Pesach. But let's say you have a loaf of bread. And you shech the carbon during Cholamoed, Pesach, okay? So Lishmo Pater Shalom Lishmo Chai. There, Reb Shimon acknowledges that you will be liable even for other carbonos. In other words, this halacha that Reb Shimon says that you're only liable for the carbon Pesach is only on Erev Pesach. But during Cholamoed, any carbon that you shech that is um, that has chametz where there's chametz present you are in violation of this mitzvah. We'll have to see where Rav Shimon gets this from. And it makes no difference whether the carbon is lishmo or shelo lishmo. Because by any other carbon other than the carbon Pesach and a carbon chatas, if, even if it's done shelo lishmo, it's still a valid carbon. If it just reverts to a carbon shlomim instead of the, de- the designated carbon. So you've still fulfilled the criteria of lo sishchat al chametz dam zivchi. And so, so first of all, it says like this. Let, so that, that's the second part of the statement. When it comes to all karbanos, whether it's lishmo, whether the shlo lishmo, you will be in violation if you do this during cholamoid. If you take a carbon pesach, and instead of shechting it on erev pesach, you shecht it on cholamoid. So then, you're going to be potter if it was done lishmo. Because we know that if Shalom Bismano, if you shech the carbon Pesach on the wrong day, the carbon is possible. And therefore, you have not fulfilled the criterion of Shechita of, of, of Kadshim. And therefore, you're not in violation. But if you do it Shalom Lishmo, remember we said Shalom Lishmo and Shalom Bismano, two negatives, makes it into a kosher carbon. And therefore, you're going to be Chayev. Now, Chutz Minachatas, and the other exception is. Says Reb Shimon that if you shech the carbon chatas during Cholamoid, you're also going and it's done shaloli shmo sheshach to shaloli shma. If you do that shaloli shma, you're going to be potter. Why? Because the only two carbonos that when you do them shaloli shma, they become puzzled is a carbon pesach on erev pesach and a carbon chatas any day of the year. Carbon chatas that's done shaloli shma is also puzzled, and therefore you're not going to be chay of the mitzvah lo sase. So bottom line is, is that let's just clarify Reb Shimon Shit because it's a little bit confusing. There's a number of different steps. Reb Yehuda is very easy to understand. Reb Yehuda says, on Erev Pesach, it doesn't matter whether it's a Korban Pesach or any other Korban, such as a Korban Tamid, as long as it's done, as, a, as long as it's a proper Korban, the halach is going to be that you're in violation of Lo Sishchad al Chametz Dam Zivchi. According to Reb Shimon, he says it depends. On Erev Pesach, you're only in violation of Los Tishchad al Chametz Dam Zivchi if you're working for the, with the carbon Pesach that's done properly. During Cholamoed, you'll be in violation. I agree with Rabbi Huda. You'll be in violation even when you're working with other carbonos, provided that it's still a kosher carbon. 
So it can't be a carbon Pesach that's done Lishmo, because that's not a kosher carbon, and it can't be a carbon Chatos that's done Shalo Lishma, because that's also not a, a kosher carbon. But any time the carbon is kosher, then you'll be in violation during Chalamoe, regardless of what of what carbon it is. Now let's take a look at the Gemara. Amar of Shimon ben Lakish, aka Reish Lakish, La Olam Eno Chayev Adshihe Achomets, La Shochet, Ola Zorek, Ola Echa Bibne Chabura. So Reish Lakish says criteria number one in order to be in violation of this halacha of Lo Sishchat Al Chomets Dam Zirchi is that the Chomets has to belong to either the Kohen who's doing the Avoda, either the Shechita or the Zerika. And by the way, the Pasuk says Lo Sishchat. So the Pasuk <coughs> is specifically talking about Shechita. Where do we get Zerika? Because it says, Lo Sishchat Al Chametz Dam Zivchi. Because the Pasuk uses the word blood in association with the Avoda, the, the, the Dam Avoda is Zerika. So the Mechilta learns that Zerika is included as well. So you got to, either the Kohen who's doing the Shechita or the Zerika is the owner of the Chametz, or one of the members of the Chabura who own this carbon Pesach are owners of the Chametz. If any one of those people, you have Tom, Dick, and Harry who are the bringers of the Korban, you have Tzadok who is the Kohen who's going to be offering the Korban. So if either Tzadok or Tom, Dick, and Harry own the Chametz, so then you are in violation if you, if, if you offer the Korban Pesach with the Chametz in possession. And second criterion, he says, is Ba'ad Shiyehi Imo Ba'azar. That the Chametz not only has to be owned by one of these people, but it actually physically has to be spatially proximal to where you're doing the avoda, And therefore, it has to be in the temple courtyard in order to be in violation. The loaf of bread has to be mamish there in order to be in violation. This is in the base Magdus, they're doing these karbanas. So I understand. Comments with them and a guy brought in a, a loaf of bread in his pocket. He didn't know. He went to the supermarket, brought a long French bread and a nice paper bag, stuffed it in his jacket pocket, and walked in with his carbon. And they said, oh, they didn't know that he had a, a French bread in his pocket. They take his carbon and they go ahead. And they, all of a sudden they say, hey, wait a minute. Your uncle's got he's, sticking out their back. <laughs> he's got a French bread sticking out of his pocket. Ah, we don't care. So if that's the case, and they gave them hasra, and they told everyone you're, what you're doing is wrong, so then everyone in the chabura gets the, is violates the mitzvahs losa, and the kohen, and the kohen who's doing the avoda gets the, violates the mitzvahs losa. That's the halacha. I'm just trying to imagine. I just gave you the illustration. <laughs> there wasn't a chametz detector. These are ordinary people. These are, you know, they're, they're human beings, but they're kohani. Those times they were very... Well, I appreciate the compliment, but, <laughs> but, but Kohanim are people too. Exactly. Yes, okay. Let us, let's, let's go fight. Mm-hmm. So Rabbi Yochanan, Omar, Rabbi Yochanan disagrees. Rabbi Yochanan says, Rabbi Yochanan says, no, even if the chametz is not physically present, you can still be in violation as long as it's owned by one of the, by either the Kohen mm-hmm. doing the Avoda or one of the members of the Chabura. The my kamiflugi. What's the machlokis? Ilema ba'al b'samach kamiflugi. The Rav Shimon ben Lakish suffer al b'samach. Rabbi Yechonan suffer lo bo'inan al b'samach. Maybe you'll tell me the machlokis is as follows. <clears throat> when the Torah uses the preposition al, which means on, one Manda Amr says that on means spatially proximal, and the other Manda Amr says no, that al doesn't necessarily mean spatially proximal. Maybe that's the machlokis. The Ha'if Lagu Bachadazimna, the Gemara says, but that should that doesn't sound right because Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lakish already debated that issue vis-a-vis another halacha. Ditnan, here's the Mishnah. Hashokhe toda lifnim, velachma chutz lachoma. Mishnah says that if a person is bringing a carbon toda, now we know that a carbon toda has to be accompanied by 40 loaves of bread. What if I go ahead? And I designate my 40 loaves, but I leave them outside, <coughs> outside the Beis HaMikdash. That's the case that the Mishnah is talking about. I leave them outside the wall. <laughs> so says, says the Mishnah, Lo Kadash HaLechem. The, the bread has not acquired what we call Kedusha Saguf. It has not acquired intrinsic Kedusha to be sanctified as the bread of the Lachmei Toda. 
right? My chutz l'chama. So then the discussion ensues, what does it mean it's outside the wall, the bread? Rabbi Yochanan Amar, chutz l'chama space pagi, aval chutz l'chama ha'azara kaddish velo ba'inan al besamach. So Rabbi Yochanan says over there, the bread is so distant, it's outside of Yerushalayim. Base pagi is on the outskirts of Yerushalayim, so the bread is really out there. It's nowhere t- in the, even in the city of Yerushalayim, and that's what the Mishnah means to say that the bread is not sanctified. But if the bread is anywhere in Yerushalayim, even if it's not on the Temple Mount, but it's somewhere in, uh, I don't know, somewhere uh, somewhere by the by the, uh, by the by the by the by the Hilton or wherever it is, not far from me. Right, but but it but it's still it, so. Rabbi Yochanan says you don't need something to be mamish proximal in order for it to be al, because the Torah uses the word al also when it talks about. Alechem uh, al chalos lechem chametz, I think is what the Torah says. That there too, it has to be pri- the word al is used when you talk about the sanctification of the bread. Rabbi Yechonah says it doesn't mamish have to be proximal; it just has to be within the vicinity of Yerushalayim. And Reish Lakish Omar afilu chutz lechamas azar lo kaddish. Reish Lakish says no. As long as it's outside the walls of the Azara, it's no longer proximal, and therefore it can't be sanctified. So you see, alma bo'inan al besamuch. So you see that. Uh, Rav Shreish Lakish requires the word al, says the word al means it has to be mamish proximal, and Rabbi Yechanan says that al does not mean physically proximal. So you see, they've already argued one time about this issue. Why do they have to argue about it again, having to do with the carbon the carbon Pesach being shechted al chametz? So ela So let's offer another alternative. The alternative is that the machlokas here is about whether or not a person can be in violation of a mitzvah slow sase and be punishable when the warning that he's received, the hasra that he's received, is tentative. Now what that means is like this. When I give a person a warning, I have to believe that he's imminently about to commit an avera, and therefore my warning is, is that what you're about to do constitutes an avera. And if he says, I acknowledge that, so then he's liable after committing the avera. But what if I'm not sure? What if it, there's no imminence to your commission of the Avera, then my, then my statement is extremely tentative. Well, what you're about to do may be an Avera, but I'm not really sure. Is that considered to be a valid hasra or not? So, so you could suggest that that's the machlokas between Rabbi Yochan and Rish Lakish over here, because if the chametz is, ma, is not mamish here that I can see, that Tom, Dick, or Harry owns chametz, I can't go over rightfully to them and say, Hey, Tom, uh, you're, you're about to be part of a carbon Pesach where one of you guys owns chametz. Well, how do you know? Well, don't you have chametz in your house? No, I don't know if I have chametz in my house. Who knows what's going on in my house? My house is a mile away from here. So that's called Hasra Safik, where the warning that is being given to any one of the members here is tentative because no one knows for sure whether he's got chametz in his house or not because it's so far away. No one, no one sees chametz in front of us. Maybe that's the machlokas that Rabbi Yechanan says that uh, hasra safik is not hasra, and Rish Lakir says that hasra safik is, <coughs> is a valid hasra. But that also has been debated between Rabbi Rish Lakish and Rabbi Yechanan previously. The itmar, it was stated as follows the Brisa says, or actually this is a, a member of Machlokas bin Rabbi Yochanan Rishlakish, if a person takes a shvua or a neder, and he says, I swear that I am going to eat this loaf of bread today. And then he goes, Va'avar hayom v'lo achla. And then the day elapses, and he ends up not eating it. So the question is, is he in violation of the neder or not? Rabbi Yochanan Rishlakish, the Amri Taravayu, ain't a He can't get Malkus for being over on a mitzvah slosa, say, of violating his neder. The question is, why not? Rabbi Yochanan Amr, Eino Loka, Mishum Dahabalei, Lav She'in Bo Maisa, V'chol Lav She'in Bo Maisa, Eino Loka, Eino Lav, Abal Hasra, Safik, Shema Hasra. Rabbi Yochanan says that, <coughs> uh, that the, the, this person, uh, the reason why he doesn't get Malkus is because you can't get malchus for inactivity, for passiveness. You can only get a malchus for violating the Torah actively. And here he sat back and did nothing. You can't get malchus for that. The other argument as to why you shouldn't get malchus is because at any given moment where I go over and I see that guy who took the shvua, that he said he's going to eat the kikar, he says, there's no imminence to his commission of the avera. 
because he could always say, okay, I'll eat it in five minutes. So I can never at any point of the day go over to that person and say, you're about to violate your nether. How do I know that you're about to violate your nether? Right? I don't know that. Just because you haven't yet eaten the loaf, maybe you'll eat it in a few minutes. So therefore, my, my uh, admonition to you, my warning to you, is, is tentative. It's all tentative. I don't know that you're imminently about to commit an Avera. I, don't, I have no evidence that you're imminently about to commit an Avera. And therefore, it's called Hasra Safek. <laughs> And therefore, it's not a valid hasra according to uh, Rabbi Yoch- according to Reish Lakish. Rabbi Yochanan says it is a valid hasra. So the Gemara says, why do they have to argue by the case of Korban Pesach about hasra safik or not? Reish Lakish Amar Enoloka Mishum Dahavale Hasra Safik Vasra Safik Loshma Hasra. Reish Lakish says that that is that, that that's not a valid hasra, and that's why you don't get Malkus of Olav Shein Bo Maisa Lokin Olav. But you do get Malkus for an act of inaction, for a passive act of not eating. So the reason why you don't get Malkus over here is because of the Hasra'a factor, that it's a tentative Hasra'a, and there's no, there's no definitive Hasra'a over here. The Gemara is basically saying that you can't tell me that the Machlokus of Reish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan by the Korban Pesach with Chametz has to do with Hasra'a Safek, because that already was discussed by the case of Nidarim. Uh, so the question, therefore, is what is their machlokis over here? It doesn't seem to be that the machlokis is of uh, uh, what the definition of al is, and it doesn't seem that the machlokis is about hasra asafe because they've already argued about those two issues previously. So amri la olam ba'al b'samach kamiflugi. So the Gemara says, no, let's go back to our first answer, and really the machlokis between Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lakish over here is what the definition of the word al means. Does al mean proximal physically or not? (coughs) Rabbi Yochanan says it doesn't mean physically proximal, and Rish Lakish means it does mean physically proximal, and that's why the bread has to be in the Azara. So why do they have to argue about this issue (coughs) by the Korban Pesach if if they've already argued about it having to do with the Korban Toda? The Gemara says, I'll tell you why. Utsricha. Di'i if ligu le'inyan chameitz hava amina so, sorry to read so much text. The Gemara says like this, Rabbi Yochanan, if I would have only had the debate between Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lakish discussed over by the Korban Pesach, I might have said that the only time Rabbi Yochanan defines the word al as not being physically proximal is only in a situation where the chametz is only by case of chametz. Why? Because chametz is designated as being usr no matter where it is in the world. It's not dependent upon a person's designa- a private designation. It's not dependent upon any specific action that I have to do in order to designate this chametz as chametz. It automatically becomes chametz no matter what once Erev Pesach sets in. And therefore, Rabbi Yochanan maybe would argue that's why it's not necessary for the chametz to be proximal to the carbon Pesach in order for me to be in violation. No matter where the chametz is, Hashem said that that chametz counts as being an iser, and therefore, even if I shech the carbon Pesach in the absence, the physical absence of the chametz, no matter where it is, it is. Whereas when it comes to the sanctification of bread, maybe Rabbi Yochanan would agree to Reish Lakish that since the sanctification of the bread re- depends upon my action and my individual designation, maybe Rabbi Yochanan would agree that the bread has to be physically proximal to the carbon toda in order for the bread to be sanctified. Maybe therefore Rabbi Yochanan would agree that there is a difference between a carbon pesach the word al by Korban Pesach and the word al by Korban Toda. And therefore, me to Dahavi Akle Shares, Rabbi Yochanan would perhaps argue that just like a um, that you need something in order for something to be sanctified, it has to be placed in a ministering vessel. In other words, something has to be placed into a klishares. Um, um, something has to be placed into a klisharis in order for that object to be sanctified, so too, bread, in order for it to be sanctified, has to be brought into the sanctum of the korban toda. 
Maybe Rabbi Yochanan would agree with that. So therefore, it's Richa. And that's why they need to discuss the Machlokas by Korban Toda as well. And conversely, And conversely, Reish Lakish, if we only had the Machlokas by the carbon toda, maybe I could have said that Reish Lakish only requires the bread to be proximal in the case of carbon toda because of the, it requires sanctification. And in order for something to be sanctified, it has to be physically present. Whereas by chametz, in order for me to be in violation of losishchad al chametz dam zivchi, since Hashem designates the, to be chametz no matter where it is, it doesn't have to be proximal. And therefore, says the Gemara, you need the machlokas to be debated in both cases to tell me that both in the case of korban chametz and in the case of korban toda, Rabbi Yochanan does not require physical proximity, and both in the case of korban pesach and in the case of korban toda, Reish Lakish does require physical proximity. Next, Ba'aminei Rav Oshia me Rebbe Ami. Ein lo l'shochet v'yesh lo la'achem ibnei chabura ma'u. Now, we had already established in the, uh, by previous Amora that it doesn't matter whether the Kohen owns the chametz or whether one of the Bnei Chabura owns the chametz. Uh, as long as we all know about it, we're in violation. Raboshia didn't know that. Raboshia therefore asked the question. He says, it seems to me quite obvious that if the Kohen doing the Avoda owns the chametz and he, he's the one shechting, then you're in violation. But what if the Kohen doesn't own chametz and one of the Bnei Chabura owns the chametz? Is there a violation in that case or not? So, Merlei, miksiv lo sishchad al chem tzicha, lo sishchad al chametz ksiv. So the answer that Rabbi Ami gave him, he said, look, it doesn't say don't shecht over your chametz. It says don't shecht over chametz, period. It doesn't matter whether it's owned by the Kohen or any one of the Bnei Chabura. As long as there's chametz owned, then there's a violation. So Amar Le'i Afilu Le'echa Besofa Olam Nami. So then Rabbi Oshia said, well, by that argument, even if a guy in China that's not part of the Chabura owns chametz, there should be a violation. Anytime there's chametz in existence, there should be a problem of shechita, of shechting the carbon Pesach. So Amar Le'i, Amar Kra, Lo Sishchat Velo Yalin, Lo Sishchat Al Chametz Hanach De Kamiyalei Mishum Lo Yalin answers the answers Rabbi Ami brilliantly. He says, "Look at the whole pasuk. It says Lo Sishchat Al Chametz Dam Zivchi." Next part of the pasuk is. You're not allowed to leave over any of the fats that are meant for the altar until the morning. So the Pasuk puts these two halachas together for some reason. Why does it put them together? It's coming to tell you that the only time ownership of chametz is problematic is for a person for whom <clears throat> his leaving over the fats of the carbon Pesach is going to be a problem. If the guy, the guy in China is not concerned and is not going to incur a penalty if my carbon Pesach is left over until the morning, if the fats of my carbon are left over until the morning. The only person who has to worry about ownership of chametz is a person who has to worry about not leaving over fats until the morning. And who is that? Either the Kohen doing the avoda, or a member of the Chabura, because it's his responsibility to make sure that the fats are burned on the Mizbeach. Okay, so now the Gemara says, um, the Gemara says, Omer Rav Papa, Hilkach Kohen HaMakter Es HaChelev over below Sasa, Ho V'yeshno Bichlal Halon HaSeimurim. So Rav Papa says, based upon that interpretation of the Pasuk, it stands to reason that not only is a Kohen who's doing the Shechita or doing the Zrika, and he owns Cham, it's going to be a problem. But even, let's say, you have a different Kohen. Let's say one Kohen did the Shechita, one Kohen does the Zrika, and a third Kohen takes the fats and puts them on the Mizbeach. If that Kohen, who's putting the fats on the Mizbeach, owns chametz, then that also creates a problem, and that also creates a mitzvah slow sase for that Kohen and for anyone else who's aware of it. Tanya Kavase de Rav Papa, the Brysa supports Rav Papa. The Brysa says, HaShochet es HaPesach al HaChametz, over below Sase, that if a person shechts a carbon Pesach and over chametz, he does a mitzvah slow Sase. Amosai, when is this true? Bizman shuhu l'shochet o l'zorek o l'echa b'bnei chabura. When it the when the chametz is owned by the shochet or the zorek or one of the members, one of the owners of the Pesach. If, it belong, if chametz is owned by a guy in China, you don't worry about it. But 
if one's if a person's shechting or zorik or placing the fat and he owns the chametz, he's going to be chayev. Aval, and then the brisa continues and it says, "Hamolik esaof be'arbo asar eno over below klum." But if a person is doing malika on the fourteenth, he doesn't violate anything. Now, what is malika? Malika is the severing of the head that you do with the bird. <laughs> Clearly, here we're not we're talking about a korban that is not the korban pesach. Rashi says bird is labdaf could be any korban, but it's typical that a an atoning korban for tuma is a bird. So if that's the case then clearly we seem to be going like Rebbe Yehuda in this b'risa. If you recall from our Mishnah, there was a machlokas between Rebbe Yehuda and Reb Shimon, whether the offering of a different carbon other than the carbon Pesach on Erev Pesach with the ownership of chametz incurs the violation. This b'risa seems to be going according to Rebbe Yehuda. Now, Urmini, let's raise a contradiction. Hashochet es ha-Pesach al chametz over below Sase, that if a person shechts over chametz, the carbon Pesach is over, and the Mitzvah Slavs say, Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Afa Tamit. And Rabbi Yehuda says it's not just the carbon Pesach, but even a carbon Tamit. So Amru Lo, Lo Amru Ela Pesach Bilvad. Comes along the other rabbis, that's Rabbi Shimon in our mission, and he says, no, it's only the carbon Pesach. Eimosai, but when is this true that there's violation? Bizman Shiyesh Lashochet, Alo Zarek, Alechem Bepnei Chabura. When the Chametz is owned by the Kohen doing the, either the Shechit or the Zrika, or one of the owners. If a guy in China owns chametz, it's not a problem. And whether you're doing shechita, zrika, malika, or hazoya, the last two having to do with the sacrificial service of a bird, which is clearly not the korban pesach, you're going to be you're going to be chayv if you own chametz. But if you do the kamitza, if you're doing a mincha offering and you do is take a fistful of flour while owning chametz, you're not in violation. And finally, and if you offer the fats or the innards on the mizbeach and you're owning chametz at that moment, you're also not in violation. So I've got, I've got multiple contradictions here. I'm running out of time, so just give me one more minute. I've got multiple contradictions here, says the Gemara. Kasha malika Malika, Kasha Haktara Ahaktara. The first Bryce and the second Bryce contradict each other in, on, on, in two respects. First of all, the first Bryce says that I will be in violation if I do Malika over Chametz. And the second Bryce says, <coughs> excuse me, just, just the opposite. The first Bryce says that I'm not going to be in violation if I'm doing Malika while owning Chametz. And the second Bryce says, I am in violation. And and the next, the second contradiction is, the first Bryce says that I'm in violation if I'm offering the fats while owning Chametz. And the second Bryce says that I'm not in violation. So, Why are you only asking this as a contradiction between one Bryce and the other? The second Bryce is self-contradictory. Why? Because if you remember, the rabbis who argue with Rebbe Yehuda, namely Reb Shimon, said back to Rebbe Yehuda, you're only in violation <clears throat> if you're offering the carbon Pesach and Erev Pesach while owning Chametz, but not by bringing other Karbanos. <coughs> the Hadertani, but then in the same breath it said right afterwards, Echad HaShochet Vechad HaZorik Vechad HaMolek Vechad HaMazah. And then it says that if you do Malika, you are in violation. The Malika is not being done with the carbon Pesach. So how can you first tell me that there's no violation with carbon Pesach, and then in the same breath tell me that if I do Malika, I am in violation? It's not a carbon Pesach. So Elahava Harib Shimon. So the Gemara says, really, the resolution is as follows: Both prices go according to Rib Shimon, who says that you only are in violation on Erev Pesach if you're doing the carbon Pesach. 